Good evening and welcome. Our story tonight is an odd one, winding down many roads seemingly unrelated and unconnected to a very strange conclusion. A songwriter and satirist you've likely never heard of, yet surprisingly virtually everywhere for the past half century. Now silenced. Stay tuned. His family moved to a small town in New Mexico in 1958, a bigger house than they had ever lived in before. Finally, he had his own room. His nights were spent listening to songs of unattainable love and longing on a little transistor radio, his lifeline to the outside world, as was the case for so many young people at that time. Oklahoma City. On Broadway in New York City at 49th Street, just north of Times Square, is the Brill Building. In offices upstairs were written some of the most famous and enduring hit songs of the late 50s and 1960s. Perhaps never in history has such a strong stream of magic originated from one place, capturing so many hearts. The Brill Building songs defined an entire generation, and many feel the magic of those songs has never been surpassed. Soon, perhaps unavoidably, as we shall see, he began writing songs of his own in the Brill Building style, and by some accounts, of similar quality. Even though he was not far from Clovis, New Mexico, where Buddy Holly recorded some of his most famous songs of that era, his songs were not recorded nor ever heard by the public. Or were they? To tell this story, we'll be using video and audio recordings we were lucky to get access to. I apologize in advance for the quality of some of this video. Most of this is less than broadcast quality, and the stuff that's really crappy will frame in this little old TV set. All it takes is a little sadness. All it takes is a little soul. All it takes is a little madness to get us to our goal. Our attention was first drawn to this story by this footage sent in by a fan of our program. Well, how could we know for sure whether our dreams aren't more real than waking reality? That's a good question, whether our dream life or our so-called waking life is more real. But you know, there's an interesting case right here in Tarn. We're taking care of this guy over at University Hospital and studying him. He's in his late 50s or so in a coma, technically. Uh, yet all the brainwave measurements show full mental activity. I mean, full, very active. But what's in there? What's going on? What's his reality? We don't really know. It would help if we could get some sign of whether you're hearing me or not, for starters. I tried to get you to blink all the regular stuff, but no response. Can't you guess from his background and his history? What makes it interesting is that he was received in this state maybe a year ago when his family, his caretakers, uh, evidently passed away. And nobody really knew about him. About him being there outside of his family who had been taking care of him. So we don't know if he was ever conscious, ever out in the world, or maybe born that way. So always in a pure imaginative state, never having experienced the world at all. Who knows what's going on in there? And maybe he just saw some TV and news, and what would he have constructed out of that in his mind? Maybe he's just as well off living in a TV reality. I guess lots of people do. The comatose patient was identified shortly after this video was shot. It's a songwriter who's our subject tonight. In investigating his story, we were given access to a huge trove of his songs, going all the way back to those Brill Building days, along with many videos and recordings done more recently. Due to an incredible tangle of miscalculations, legalities, and just plain jealousy, very few of these hundreds of songs, rock, country, and otherwise, have ever seen the light of day. Tonight we'll explore this huge trove of material and how most of it was denied a chance to be heard or seen by the public, as well as a mysterious personal connection to the Brill Building, which may require a leap of faith to understand. We're aware, of course, that songwriters do not loom large in the public imagination. 
especially compared to the artists who make the songs popular. But we think you'll be amazed by this story. Stick with us. No taking, no breaking my heart. If these songs seem familiar, it's because they do sound so much like the songs of that era. These are demo recordings and videos made several years after the songs were written by our now comatose songwriter when he was still in his early teens. Every now and then on my radio show, I play some of Jim's real building style songs. Someone would always call in to say they were glad to hear these oldies again, and I'd say no, they're not anything you've ever heard before. They're just in that 60s style. People would get pretty insistent though, but that's just a testament to how well they captured that era, I guess. Somebody even sent me a video she did of one of Jim's country songs from his book. I think it's really sweet. But I think the dog misses you. The way a silence someone kisses you. Sometimes he seems to cry at night. When I turn off the bedroom light. I guess he just can't stand up to smell your hands and how he loves your tender touch. Yeah, that stupid dog, he misses you so much. According to our investigation, the tangle started back in those Brill Building years when his parents hired an attorney, not one well-versed in entertainment law, because of course there were none in that small New Mexico town, to create a legal structure for publishing these songs written by the then minor child. Here's author and journalist Gershon Siegel, who has followed this story for years, long before we got involved. I didn't know Jim was missing in Intercoma. And of course, I'm sorry to hear that. But yes, I've been following him for years. Publishing is the music industry term dealing with original songs, not the recording and records, but the songs themselves, which were usually written by someone other than the recording artist, especially back in the 1960s and earlier. So what kind of value are we talking about here for a song or a catalog of songs? A hit song can be worth millions of dollars for the songwriter and publisher if they're lucky enough to have it recorded by a star or upcoming star and have a hit record. That's separate from the money made on the songs by the recording artist or record company. Thank you, Gershon. British author and journalist Tony Byworth has been in and out of Nashville as long as any observer, and in fact was co-editor of the Billboard Encyclopedia of Country Music. He has followed the country music end of Jim's career for decades. Now, I think with Jim Turner's music, what strikes me, first of all, it, it relates back, if you're talking about country music songs, it relates back to as country music was. You know, he, he has the old themes there, uh, what's happened to country music today has become rock and pop, whereas Jim's music is, is country to the extent of the, you know, the, the three chords and the truth type songs. He writes about small towns like Small Town Radio, which I think is one of his great songs. Small Town Radio, you hear it everywhere you go. One way I learned about the things I know About New York, L.A. and Tokyo Jim says some impressive comparisons made in reviews of his music. Tom T. Hall, Bobby Bear, Ray Stevens, Phil Oates. And he's gotten some good reviews from Tom T. Hall and Bobby Braddock, the guy who wrote absolutely everything, you know. And Dave Barry, Tony Orman. I want to thank our uh, previous host who's back again. Uh, your previous uh, video has gone viral. I appreciate it very much. Let it help my dog. So what have you chosen for us today? Doing mud video. That's a fine selection and uh, fashioned after what uh, famous baseball poem, of course? Passing room in the bathroom, of course. By? Hey, yay! Yes, uh, it's a recitation. It's just words. 
It's fashioned after the uh, baseball classic called uh, Casey at the Bat. And uh, are you with me here? Come on, this is fascinating stuff. Anyway, of course, the original has uh, nothing to do with romance, but that is the stuff of modern songs. And I think the story works very well. And it's a story of reconciliation, of an almost magical uh, reuniting, uh, the return of the, uh, what do you call it? Son. Yes, the prodigal son, and it's it's frankly very melodramatic, but uh, I think it works. I hope you like it as much as I do. Well, let's hear it. The dessert. The way I see country music these days, it's pop records made for kids. You know, pop and rock records being bought by youngsters. That's the way it's being sold. Um, why they call it country, I'm not too sure, because it really doesn't possess anything about country. Whereas Jim songs relate to the old country feeling. We're road show rejects, got a few too many defects. Just old enough to be interesting, not rare enough to be worth a thing. But we're dear to the ones that love us, and true to the one above us. We did our job as best we know. We're just along for the old road show. Um, he he's, has a perception about music, about life. He's even been compared comedically to Shel Silverstein, Loudon Wainwright III, Mark Twain, Jackie Mason, for God's sake. There's humor in so many of Jim's songs which seem to be almost entirely missing these days. Once upon a time, you would have humor, you like Roger Miller or Shel Silverstein, for instance, who can come up with great humorous comical songs. Now Jim has that in like, did it hurt when he fell out of heaven? But since you've tumbled on down to our hot little town, why don't you let me buy you a beer? <laughs> I should just quit right there. <laughs> well, it's storytelling, isn't it? Like they used to say about country music. I think it is coming back. I hope it's coming back. People missing country music as it was. Jim, as you're aware, has a lot of hits on, on YouTube. I think he's got about nearly two million hits now. So take a break now, Jimmy. Lay your burden down. You've done more work than anyone around. So it shows people like the music as far as I'm concerned. People like what he writes. Otherwise, you know, people wouldn't be watching it. But the lamp that lit Boston still burns between us so bright in my sight that if I can't lie with you let me lie near you tonight When I was governor, my good friend Jim Turk came to see me with a beautiful song, a great New Mexico song, and I tried to help him get some funding. And I just thought, with the international negotiations I'm doing with North Korea, that if the North Koreans could hear this song and see a video of this song, they'd fall in love with the West, with New Mexico, they'd feel better about America. To maybe make things a little better between the United States and North Korea. New Mexico, the skies of blazing red and silver. New Mexico, Summer mountains topped with snow New Mexico Where it rains out in the sunshine I arrived here as a stranger Now I can't leave New Mexico Journalist Bill Hutchison has also followed Jim's songwriting for years. More bad news in a moment on Mornings Considered. But first, Jim Turr's music has gone largely unrecognized by Nashville, and according to critic Bill Hutchison, it's likely to stay that way. Here's the story. 
Critics have said that if Tammy Wynette were alive today, there's little doubt that she'd record both of Jim Turr's nouveau Wynette compositions, This Changes Everything. This changes everything. The sparkle of this wedding ring. And three tiered wedding cake. Try a bit for your own sake, my tender three tiered wedding. But Tammy Wynette isn't alive today, and with Turr stubbornly living in New Mexico and with no contacts whatsoever in Nashville, few of his songs are likely to be recorded. That doesn't mean there aren't some incredible gems on his new, non-eponymous but self-penned CD. Turr shares equal territory with the folky politicism of Phil Oakes, the sheer songwriting skill of Towns Van Zant, and the shamelessly naive sense of ironic humor of Loudon Wainwright III. In fact, almost every song on the new CD is a tribute and a brilliant tribute to some classic rock or country style from Lieber and Stoller. So don't be taken in by words so sweet and witty. They were written by some guy in Kansas City. To Goffin and King in the Brill Building years. Duets of George Jones and Tammy Wynette. They could have never seen our compatibility. Cause they never met anybody like you and me. Nobody like you and me. It might seem surprising that a barely 30 reviewer whose own music collection tends toward Bright Eyes and the Decemberists would respond to such hardcore Jerry Lee Lewis type songs as Bring in the Honky Tonk Home, but such is Turr's gift with lyrics. Where everyone feels welcome. Hakeem, Jose, and Jerome And you and me, that's why I'll be Bringing the honky-tonk home Atlantic Monthly National Correspondent James Fallows says, quote, Jim Turr's spirit shows through consistently in his songs, as it does in his essays and other projects. It's the droll, sardonic, cut-the-BS outlook known around the world as American. One country legend who does give Jim Turr his due is semi-retired superstar Buddy, who turns in a nimble duet with singer Gwen Lenore. The butcher picked up on that spark and said, Buddy, muzzle tuck, whatever that means. Let's go back to your place and wrestle up some love. Uh, we're glad to lend some of our star power to help old Jim get some play on the radio or the internet web or what have you, because he has written some of our bigger hits, so we just want to give something back. <laughs> For a writer whom critics have compared to Shel Silverstein, Tom T. Hall, Paul Kraft, and even Mark Twain and Will Rogers, Turr is a little disappointed that he's received the most airplay so far on the novelty song, Do They Have Email in Heaven? Do they have email in heaven? If not, I don't want to go. But he's confident his compositions will find a home eventually, if only after he's dead. She taught me how to sit and cry the whole night long. She taught me how to sing these songs all right. Combining comedy with tragedy, optimism with hopelessness, and prolific wit with his favorite three chords, Jim Turr's songs are triumphant anthems to this difficult business of living. The CD is Please Cut My Song, Mr. Travis by Jim Turr. More information at bluecanyonmusic.com. Our reviewer is Bill Hutchison of the Anthologist Cabinet of Musical Marvels, anthologist.org. With all of these restrictions on his music, how did Jim get by? Remember, there was evidently some arrangement for Buddy recording Jim's songs. So that yielded a fair income for Jim as a songwriter, enough to allow Jim to record a lot of demos of his songs, which is how all these videos came about. But another of the few venues that were open to him was Jingles, different legal status. Jingles were partly his way of striking out at this rather unfair and stifling situation. And he's done a lot of jingles, including a couple that have been heard nationally. Hi from Snapple. Jim Turr of New Mexico sent us this tape. He calls it Sing a Song of Snapple. Sing a song of Snapple, but wait until you drink. Cause singing while you're swallowing is harder than you think. Grab that friendly bottle, enjoy its heft and girth. And gulp the drink that's made from all the finest stuff on earth. Okay, kids, 
sing a song of snap all the way to drink. People feel at home at Walmart. People feel at home at Walmart. We're trying to keep uh, clean and uh, beautiful here in New Mexico. Riding the highway in New Mexico, I saw litter around me, above and below. Then a spirit appeared, as sweet as a kiss. She told me a secret as simple as this. Toss no mas, that's what she said. My beauty is fading, it soon may be dead. You're spoiling my highways, my beautiful lands. But you hold the answer in the palms of your hands. Hold on, Mama. Hold on, Mama. I think I feel a song coming on. Okay. I think I do too. Sometimes a restaurant is more than you could ever want. Not just a place to ease your hunger, but to meet your friends, both older and younger. Charlie's is just that kind of place. A tasty dish on every plate from all across. That dog. God Almighty, so tasty and so bitey, good to chew, maybe even good for you, that dog. We're stronger than we've ever been, stick with us and you'll always win, cause we're your bank, and we're saying thanks, the bank of Las Vegas. Feed your tongue something yummy, yes you should. Drop by here, grab a view, yes you could. Spanglish muffins will be stuffing you good. Have you ridden the rail runner? Nothing could be stronger than cruising beautiful terrain on a first class high speed high line train. A hundred miles all the way, it'll really make your day. Bringing kindness to those who need it, that's our only function. Being and housing those in need, joy junction. Thank you, Gershon. We'll explore further how the restrictions you referred to managed to stay in place for decades keeping a good body of songs completely out of circulation. First, though, this story could never be complete without a few words about Buddy. Yes, the capital D's are how Buddy insists his name be spelled. There's not much everybody doesn't already know about Buddy, at least according to Buddy. A somewhat successful country singer and tycoon hailing from the Tri-Cities area, he says, without ever specifying which Tri-Cities area he's referring to. Sugar, where are you from? Well, wouldn't you like to know, little Donna? Hell, we're from the Tri-Cities area. Everybody knows that. Well, what do y'all think? Jim's friend, nemesis, associate, in many ways his alter ego and certainly the beneficiary of his songwriting. Even this reporter was pulled into the vortex of this contentious relationship. I'm glad to speak to you and help clear the air here. You seem to be making some serious allegations about my client, Buddy, in connection with your story about one of his songwriters. Minor one, by the way. First, with regard to this real estate ad, which you're implying has some great significance as far as the aborted presidential primary run, it proves nothing. Buddy has done many commercials for many projects as a paid spokes jowl. <laughs> Please don't include that. It's a it's an inside joke. Y'all ready to go? Where y'all going? Come on. Come on, we need you here. Come on, we're gonna be in the movies now. Turners buys and burgers with prairie home fries without biting into bison. Today I will die when you're running low on buffalo and ain't had your fill. Just drag your old carcass into Ted's Montana grill. As a paid spokesperson for many products, no significance, nothing to see there. Look. 
like talking to you at all. We haven't done anything illegal at all. It's called marketing strategy. That's my business. You've heard of corporations being people? Well, I'm a person who thinks I'm a corporation. Now look, our clients were looking for a candidate to serve their interest, which is also legal, by the way. And so we went searching for someone new, fresh. Again, no one knows more about this odd pair than author and journalist Gershon Siegel. Yeah, I actually think I'm the only journalist that ever interviewed both Buddy and Jim. The relationship has always been interesting and, you know, it's been contentious. Jim, of course, uh, wrote many of Buddy's biggest hits. did pretty well doing that, but uh, I actually think Jim was resentful for not having that spotlight, you know, that, that Buddy had. They said just give the millionaires a tax break and you'll see the only one getting trickled on is me. Yeah, please trickle on somebody else but me. You know, Buddy actually is funny. He resented the fact that Jim wouldn't just write for him exclusively. And not write for anybody else but, but Buddy. <laughs> Cops finally broke down that door, the whole scene made it edgy. They found two beasts who'd never more be happy eating veggies. Ginkgo tofu, let us hear your wild savage song. One fine day your time will come and it probably won't be long. All we know for sure is that late last year, Buddy was doing this USO tour and he invited Jim to do a few songs as his opening act. As we've all heard, sometime after Jim got off stage, he totally disappeared for about a day, and then he claimed he never remembered what happened to him. I've gone from being your real estate agent, to your advisor, to your friend and confidant, and now basically your nurse. And what have I gotten out of it? I'm glad you can't respond, because I'm not asking, I'm telling you. Thank you, Gershon. The crowd is still arriving on this cold evening for a much-awaited lifetime tribute to Buddy. Let's go inside now, where the tributes to Buddy from his famous friends are about to begin. The crowd is excited, and we're excited, to see who took time to say a few words about Buddy. Damn it, Buddy, get your feet off the table! Hell, we need to be telling old Buddy what to do. This is our award show. We dressed up in our best, best shirt we got, and I got it. Quiet, they're, they're talking about us down there. And here's tonight's first tribute from humorist Dave Barry. I don't think there's any one human being who's had more of an influence on my life than Buddy has, uh, except maybe uh, Jesus or Abraham Lincoln. Oh, no, that ain't, that ain't right. <laughs> don't be so nice to Buddy. Buddy came in. This is so. From day one, he was everybody's cousin, and everybody thought he was their cousin. As soon as his old buddy just simply absorbed it and regurgitated it. There's a fair amount of regurgitation in the Delta, particularly on weekends. Buddy fit right in with all of that. You get a drink, little darling? I, I do get a drink. Where, where, here, I got one back here for you. All right. Old buddy ain't holding out on you. Old buddy don't, don't drink, you know. Okay, shh, quiet. We're talking about us down there. 
It's probably difficult to know whether uh, Buddy's many fans need him more or whether he needs them more. Some perhaps may adopt even uh, almost a, a parental love that, that they have come tonight to take care of their little boy on the stage. It's a real nice to hear from me. Hey, you hear what they're saying? It's all true. I had a 45, our sidearm was a 45, which is about as worthless a weapon as ever been invented. But I had it, I had four rounds, I had one clip with four rounds in it left. And just as I got to the asphalt, the German coming the other way got to the asphalt. I got there first, I was settled down, I had my pistol out and cocked. And I, I, shot, I, I shot low at him, hoping to hit him in the abdomen and I hit him right in the face. It doesn't say much for my marksmanship, but it knocked him backwards. So one of his feet were on the asphalt. And uh, that, that, here I am, how many years later, 50, in more than a half century later, I still remember that as vividly as if it happened yesterday. I always regretted it. He probably some kid about 19, 18, like I was. And, uh, and now he's dead. When I went to visit Buddy in the Tri-Cities to try to learn more about him, I think one of the things that impressed me most came on a visit to the barbecue, just an ordinary experience. But it was clear that although Buddy dealt with the, the, the regulars of the barbecue just as if they were all equals, the kind of respect and awe that they held for him, that was evident in everything that went on. I don't know what you're saying. Oh, oh, oh. Hiya, buddy. This is your old pal Phil Proctor. He said, that's perfect. We do comedy that people think is not funny. So we hired you on to open for us. And I hope, I hope in my heart that in a certain way, that was the beginning of a career for you. <laughs> you all having a good old time? I got old buddy here. They don't have a, they don't have an award show for us every day, you know. It's quiet. We're watching the show. I, I remember it must have been about a year and a half ago. Uh, I was with Buddy, and, and I, I, I actually think it's a story that, that summarizes some of his sense of nobility and sacrifice. Because oh, that's too nice. Uh, <laughs> don't you think? It's too nice. Well, they're awful flattered of you, Buddy. Place because there was all this talk going on then about uh, marriage between partners of the same sex, or as uh, Buddy called it, you know, guys getting together with guys, gals getting together with, with gals. And uh, Buddy confided to me that, that he's had a great sacrifice in his own life because um, beginning in, in 1989, Buddy fell in love with a... With hey, don't be saying that! Cut off that tape! Cut off that tape! Uh, By golly! devoted to that facade, which is kind of... The jingle work mentioned earlier provides a good segue into one of the stranger episodes you'll hear about tonight, his very unusual run for president. That's right, president of the United States. He ran as a Republican in the 2012 Arizona presidential primary, and by the way, got more votes than some other candidates, and was listed on the ballot ahead of such well-known names as Newt Gingrich, Ron Paul, and Mitt Romney. Rather than relying on his own skill, he turned to the very respected Don and Victoria Armstrong for help with his campaign jingle. Well, thank you for meeting with me and offering to try this. I um running for president in Arizona, like I said, believe it or not. And uh, I need a jingle, and I know you guys can deliver something really appealing. I'm willing to pay you the big bucks like you charge for this service. So I'd love to watch you work. I love the way you work. So see what you can come up with. Hmm. Hmm. Well, let's see. Termite, termite, stand up on his hind legs and fight for the good, 
for the right. Ter is very likely to termite. 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 Stand upon his hind legs and fight for the good, for the right. Ter is very likely to termite. We'll let Dave Moss, now of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, explain how this unlikely presidential run came about in the first place. A friend of mine, uh, Jim Ninsel, who was at the time senior writer for the Tucson Weekly, had discovered that in order to get on the presidential primary ballot in Arizona, all you had to do was file a notarized document saying, I want to be a candidate on the presidential primary. In 2012, unfortunately, we could only have people run on the Republican side. And so that made it a little bit more difficult to try to find people to run as Republicans. Now, I had long been a fan of Jim Terror back from when I was a reporter in Santa Fe, and I'd been trying to work with him for a while. I thought that maybe he would want to participate in running for president. We ended up having a few televised debates. The first one was a nightmare. Jim Turr, we weren't ever sure how much he was in character, how much he was not in character. You have to bring things out in the open, how you feel. If you hide things, you will become very disturbed in your mind. So I'm very open when it comes to issues like that. I don't hold anything back. I understand. Now, Jim, got any thoughts on it? I would it? first like to say that is the biggest watch I have ever seen. You were going to show it up to the audience? And uh, by the way, as a, proud, <laughs> uh, as a proud gay man, I don't appreciate your comments, but I forgive you. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, America. And as being a, a proud, straight American, I forgive you for being gay. <gasps> thank you. Thank you. I need that. Our history, our heritage. Great Americans should be remembered, memorialized. Pancho, Pancho Villa, was he American? I'm Jim Turr, candidate for president in the Arizona primary of February 28th. You know, my political handlers and puppet masters have suggested I start attacking my opponents. But I think I have a better way. I'd like to remain positive and talk about my own vision for a better America. Now, in fact, I have this heavy dossier of damaging information on all four of my opponents, but I'm not the sort of person who would sling mud like that. No, I'd prefer to remain positive. Talk about my own vision for America, whatever that is. Remember my campaign slogan, chicken in every garage. And my other campaign slogan, if nominated, I will not run. Please vote for me on February 28th. Give Jim Turr a chance to steal from you. And actually, Jim had some additional outside encouragement as well to enter the race. So you see, the key to making millions of dollars in country music is not necessarily to be great at it. Not to be a, you don't have to be a great singer, not even a great writer. All you need is my book here, and it... Shit. Damn it. That is... Yes, hello. Tr Dr Trump. Yes, Trump. Donald Trump. Yes, I've, I've heard of you. You have a TV show or something? Yes, I'm sure it's excellent. No, I just don't have a TP, no. What can I do for you? You won't be running? You won't be running for president? I didn't know you were a Republican. <laughs> I'm not a Republican. I can enter the Arizona primary anyway? Just switch my registration? You think I can make America great again? Well, thanks for your confidence. I always thought so too, but I didn't know anyone else Oh, thanks. You've enjoyed my videos and my CDs, my stage presence. Is there any cost? Oh, that's good. Sounds like fun. Thanks for letting me know you won't be running in this one and suggesting I do. <laughs> could be a, could be fun. And solar energy, and if people only believe in it and use it, the cost of putting it in is very small compared to the benefits you reap. 
As one entertainer to another, it sounds like a great goof. Maybe I'll make a movie out of it. Can you get your pals at the National Enquirer to give my candidacy a boost? Oh, you're saving that for yourself. Okay. Well, yeah, let's stay in touch. I'll, I'll save your number for, uh, to my contacts, if you don't mind, and maybe we can share the, maybe I can share the benefit of my experience with you when you run, or run again, or whatever. Sure, okay, stay in touch. Thanks a lot. Trump. T. T. R. Okay, you want me to look at you or at the cameras? Okay. Uh, good evening, gentlemen. I am Jim Turr, not a well-known name in politics yet. I was drafted into being a so-called uh, dark horse candidate in the Arizona primary by parties who appreciate my reach, my touch with the American people, the so-called common people. <clears throat> In case you're not familiar with me, I've submitted a file of... Okay, get on with it. Okay. <coughs> I was wondering about your use of the royal we, the editorial we that you refer to yourself as. Can you explain that? Well, we're just talking about what we're feeling, what we're thinking. As long as we can get our pork rinds whenever we want them. I get a powerful hunger for pork rinds every now and then. Mm. Mm. Yeah, this here's what they call acrylic paint. Well, Las Vegas, New Mexico was a big town at the turn of the century, and it had an opera house and all sorts of cultural events. And there were movies made. Uh, Tom Mix and Romaine Fielding were among the people that were here. Jim came across some wax cylinder recordings of short recitations, and he decided this must be Romain Fielding when he was here making movies from 1913 to 1915. Recordings of story pitches, maybe to staff or possibly to uh, potential investors. That's what they sound like, but they're very contemporary. He signed the post above his door. The tentacles, no less, no more. And Jim came up with some early films of Romaine Fielding reading these scripts. A family who can well afford to travel overseas, to visit European spas and castles as they please. That's where I got suspicious. A frontier hotel and saloon with a more than respectable gambling room against miners and cowboys adequate odds to make the house the winning god. Because they were before movies had sound. The battle of the century went only nine short rounds. But hot were hopes for vengeance when Jack Johnson came to town. A tall white woman on each arm and proudly did they stride. And black is he the race about in which he did arrive. That's all a little mysterious, but uh, that's the way Jim is. Other than his very rare music performances and his TV jingles and radio jingles, there's one other thing that Jim might be remembered for in New Mexico. It was a TV show he hosted on community television in Santa Fe and Albuquerque around the turn of the century, uh, a parlor game, a word game many people are familiar with. But, of course, Jim added his own twist, which was that he could win, which he sometimes did. Huh. Um, <laughs> the way the game works is there are three ways you can make points. One is anytime anybody votes for your phony definition. I'm, I'm, I'm. Since we're on the subject of videos, let's sample a few not related to their presidential run. Enjoy the show. It's no good, Maxine. What's that, Larry? The satire. The satire. Nobody's interested anymore. What satire, Larry? The satire, Maxine. Satire. That's what I do for a living. Come on, Larry. You're good. You're the best. No, it's no good, Maxine. Nobody cares anymore. I'm washed up. Have a cigarette, Larry. It'll calm your nerves. I don't smoke, Maxine. I'm washed up. 
No, Larry, you're still the best in the business. It's easy as it could be in the hell. For a zombie. A so-called zombie. I've been called a vampire even before I ever became one. Officially. I can live on other stuff besides, you know. I hate to say it, these two freaks. Did you put plenty of uh, cream in this? I mean soy milk. It is soy, right? I can't have dairy. It gives me such mucus. Yeah, like I really want to hear all about your mucus. Again! Hollywood Neat will make a star out of you. Yes, Mr. Spielberg. I'm sure he'll talk to you. Hold just a minute. It's for you! Cut! That's a wrap. Excellent. Excellent. Woo! <laughs> Let's call it a day. All right. Okay. So when do we have to have the car back to the workshop? Want to get it back by about two Thanks so much for having me grab it. Perfect day, really. Good morning. I'm your uh, Dr. Ralph Rappaport from the university. And with today's Fracking Today, where we learn to understand fracking and how similar it is to many everyday processes that we do every day and uh, so we can learn to understand it and uh, be comfortable with it comfortable with it and uh, understand that it's it's safe and sometimes even fun and our guests today are Mary and Joseph Whitehall from uh, Mary and Joseph's of course the very popular eatery here in town and uh, uh, with today's example of fracking in everyday life, uh, it has to do with a very common process we all, well, most of us, do, some of us do every day around the home. And uh, of course, done with great skill and popularity at Mary and Joseph's um, a popular eatery. Uh, Mary, would you like to explain what we're going to do today? Yes, what we're going to do is we're going to take this liquid and we're going to, under pressure, forcefully inject it into this chuck roast. They never could have matched up our personality Cause they never met anybody like you and me Nobody like you and me This is a free country with freedom of religion. So if Jennifer doesn't want to pray with us, if her parents don't want her to pray with us, that is absolutely okay. So let's not mock Jennifer if she prefers to sit silently while we pray or sing Christmas carols. Maybe Jennifer and her parents have some higher God or higher power that protects them. We don't know, do we? So, Marilyn Britt, artist, okay. talk to me. Okie doke. Okay, stop. Yeah. Can we just turn off the camera and start over? Why is that? Oh, it's Meredith. Meredith? That's fine. Meredith okay. Britt. Excuse me, I'm a. Oh, it's, it's not, it's not no, substantial. I, I get called that all the time. Okay. Uh, Mildred. Mar Mildred Britt. Uh, artist, talk to me uh, about that. How does it feel? Uh, it feels good, and uh, it has now for quite some time, since about 1948. Uh -huh. yeah, I'm talking about being an artist. Exciting. Uh, uh, I, talk to me about that. I've always been excited, and... Um, I just keep making art, and uh, when I don't, I'm not excited. Let's talk about that. I want to talk more about that. Okay. Art. Don't art. Worry. It's exciting. It's fabulous. Like uh, Marion Britt, uh, agree or disagree? Art. It's exciting. I disagree. Can you get my name right? I mean, I, I don't mind what you call me, but... Did you get beat up today at the office? What office? 
<laughs> I know how that is. No, you don't. So what's your name? Carlos. So Carlos, is this your normal guy? Not exactly. Well, Carlos, go for it. Okay. Best of luck to you. Thank you. If you can see it in my eyes, I've been dead since 75. But these cold, dark taverns make me come alive. I'm Rex Tillerson, CEO of Exxon, and I'm here to tell you that fracking is safe for you and the environment and your drinking water. Pure, clean water. Water. Land's what we use to frack. We inject it into the good green earth, and then we pump it back. Excuse me, wait a minute. I want no goddamn fracking near my goddamn ranch. But even that wasn't enough to break any of us. Because we were on top. We were the kings. We were the rat pack. downtown local to find most anything transfer to the cross town to drop in at the zoo but any old train any old train Growing up in Las Vegas, growing up in a small town, you know a lot of neighbors who you are acquainted with and you feel like you belong in a sense, although I managed to feel that I didn't belong anyhow somehow. Yeah, steel libido indeed. <laughs> excellent, excellent. A lot of people with who need such a thing, is it? <laughs> Yeah, Las Vegas, New Mexico. A lot of films have been shot here. Yeah, a lot of them. Look it up. I was born here. No, you weren't. I wasn't? No, I remember that. Well, I was raised here, I'm quite sure. Grew to manhood here. Killed my first man here. Oh, bullshit. Well, I killed my first audience here. <laughs> Well, let me tell you something. When the chemistry is right, there is no fighting it. And when he met me, he made a complete fool out of himself. Isn't that right, honey? That's right, love. <laughs> love. I love how they say that. The better question, not why he left you at this particular time. And Doris, 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 that whiny voice of yours is enough to drive anyone away. In fact, I'm going to have to hang myself if that's okay. I can't take it anymore. Okay, okay, Doris. Okay, honey, you call us back soon, okay? Bye-bye. Of course we're planning to remove their guns. Guns are dangerous. I was in the army. They kill people. They make holes in people. Bigger than my mouth. After the revolution, I'll become Minister of Defense. They won't really take their guns away. I'm sorry to be late for... Bavarian days here in your great state of your great city of I love this state. I love this state. The flesh is just about right. I mean the fresh breeze. The breeze is just about right. First question. Is it we got two uh kids? Uh uh Blackie, I know, is one of them. 
Uh, the other one is... Uh, Azalea. Azalea. You always forget her name. I don't know. I got that. plenty of reason for forgetting their names. Uh, you remember one of them, Blackie. One of them's uh, in, uh, in, in incarcerated. Uh, we, we, is it just one now? The bash is skull into the freaking ground. What are you doing? Person. That's my line, Muttley. Not in front of the perp. Not in front of the perp. I don't give a shit about the goddamn perp. You stole my idea. That's my thing. Jefferson, shut up. No, that's my bit. You stole my bit. And videos brings us to another amusing and totally unproductive area, his inventions. Inventions for health and fitness, labor saving and safety, and scores of other purposes. These contrivances number over a hundred, and not one ever reached the actual production line or produced a penny of revenue. But as he has said on many occasions about all this activity, I want to keep my brain alive and in good shape in case I ever need it. I guess I was a little bit rude to Jim when he, when he came to the show with one of those wacky inventions. I'd be kinder to him now because I got to know him a little bit. But he really does have this warehouse full of these crazy, wild inventions. When email and Facebook are filling your clock, reclaim your life with the internet block. So then the human, uh, as he runs, he is, does this natural motion. All of which seem to have the same thing in common. But they're not going to sell. And so, truth be told, some of them are clever, some of them are interesting, but, but they seem to be made for his own amusement. Introducing Jackalope Droppings. I love how about sauerkraut? If you've ever been to his home, and I have, it's like a Rube Goldberg fantasy land. All these levers and switches and wires and latches. Some of which isn't attached to anything. Everything seems to be rigged for some kind of labor-saving device or for exercise or something. Uh, but all these little gadgets and latches and wires and switches and, and stuff. It's all very ingenious, I suppose, but there's nothing marketable there that I can tell. At the beginning of this program, we made references to fate, destiny, to a possibly inescapable path and connection to the Brill Building. In her book, Strange Destinies, Faith Knuckler devotes a whole chapter to Jim, not because he's a big celebrity, which he isn't, but because it's an unusual case of so many stars, if you will, pointing in the same direction. Now, my book is about strange connections in people's lives or their birth. Jim is not one of the more famous people in my book, but he does have an extraordinary number of coincidences. For one thing, consider that Jim was born just five days after Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated. There was a man with a mission, right? And five days after Orville Wright died, and Jim is quite the inventor too. And if you consider his career path as an actor, a satirist, a documentary filmmaker, he was born the same day, I mean day and year, as Barbara Hershey. And the same day and year as Christopher Guest actor and satirist, and the same day as Errol Morris, within a few miles of where both of them were born, in New York. And now in terms of songwriting, his great-grandfather was a composer and lyricist in the Yiddish theater in New York. In fact, he co-wrote with Michael Tilson, Thomas' grandfather, Boris Tomaszewski, who was a big star. He had the biggest funeral crowd in New York ever up to that time. And then, to top it off, Jim doing films and music for films, he had three great uncles he never knew and never knew about till much later in his life who worked in Hollywood. All three of them in music 
and all but one as actors. And one of them, Max, was the composer for the Jitterbug novelty film that's very popular on YouTube, Groovy Movie. <laughs> Jim's best known song was about the jitterbug. Do you like the jitterbug? Spinning with a little tug. Drinking soda from a mug. Digging things that ain't been done. Do you like to cut a rug? Do you like to kiss a mug? Do you like the jitterbug? That's a lot of destiny in one birth and one lineage, one package of DNA. Fascinating stuff indeed. Thanks, Faith. I'll leave it to our viewers how much weight to place on this sort of analysis. But do keep in mind the Brill Building connection when we come back to it. And regarding the world-saving impulse, we came across these photos of a young American traveling through the Soviet Union in 1984, taking photographs of Soviet people to bring back to the U.S. to create a people-to-people -people connection. Churches, schools, civic groups, and top U.S. government officials and agencies, short only of the CIA itself, lauded the effort. The Katie Archer situation? Well, it's just like the rest of what's going on in this country. The socialists, or liberals, are trying to tear this country down, but making it sound like they're doing it for your welfare. But at least in this little town, I got influence on in the radio station and all, and I'm not going to make it easy for them. I'm not sure how I feel about having my picture taken on film for one of these talkies. Um, but I'll say it's been a privilege to have known Mother Jones and had some small association with her on the Ludlow Massacre situation and to perhaps have done some good. Of course, we still have the restaurant to run, but I still try to do what I can. With the, uh, with the struggle and all. A museum for Katie Archer? Give me a break. What did she ever do to deserve that? I, I don't consider her a patriot or a role model. This is as good a time as any to mention yet another unexpected little jog in this strange fellow's stretch of life's highway. With all that we've discussed so far, who would expect to find a whole Sunday morning's worth of odd but sincere gospel songs? By now, you wouldn't expect anything in the traditional mold, but we think you will agree these songs are completely without irony or snark. They were recorded under the pseudonym Chad Wiggly, a perfectly plausible name for a good old boy country singer, don't you think? Well, I went deep in the end zone just to please the cheering crowd. Went deep a couple other times I cannot say out loud. I see the face of Jesus every time I smooth my bedspread. Every time I shampoo my head, every time I crack an egg. If Jesus ran the country, he'd help a homeless vet. Cause that's just you or me to whom it ain't quite happened yet. I know you know how weak I am, how prone to break and bleed. I hope you'll save my fragile soul when it comes my time of need. Lord, be my airbag when I crash into that ball. When the vehicle I'm driving comes to a sudden crawl. Yes, a blunt and dangerous weapon ain't what you call romance. So leave some room for Jesus when you dance. Have you tried the jitterbug or swing dancing by chance? Why don't you make some room for Jesus when you dance? Thank God for the line between your life and mine. For the veil between who's you and who's me. I'd really be lost. If I knew the true cost of the sadness around me, I see. How many people saw Brokeback Mountain here? Yeah. yeah. My mom, who is 89, a uh, very hip lady, very funny, sometimes intentionally, sometimes not. She, uh, 
went to see Brokeback Mountain with my sister who told me that, you know, if you haven't seen Brokeback Mountain, there's this period at the beginning when if you know what the movie's about, I think a lot of people, at least myself for instance, are sort of in a state of apprehension about when is this horrible thing going to happen, <laughs> and so on and so on, and a kind of a nervous state. And um, <clears throat> my mom, uh, my sister says that my mom was uh, <laughs> sitting there with her watching, and it was one of the early scenes where they're herding the uh, sheep up the mountainside to the range and uh, the grand music and all that. And uh, my mom leans over and says, I don't know why it's getting so darn hard to find lamb chops in the grocery store. <laughs> <laughs> Who's to say that little snap of Jesus? A picture of a time so far away Wasn't just exactly what we needed And doesn't have its power still today I can still smile when I hear a small puppy sneeze Though I'm missing a bit in the high frequencies I can still hold a baby And feel all that love And wonder at the snowfall From the heavens above And some people have in fact noted A certain resemblance To one of the best modern depictions Of the master himself as well as to George Washington, Ben Franklin, and Abraham Lincoln. Again, we'll leave any conclusions to the viewer. Let's turn now to just one more song collection. Songs and demos recorded by other artists, besides Buddy, before getting back to the serious business of, again, why you probably never heard of any of this material until now. You collide, though our past came in from different sides. They could have never seen our compatibility. Cause they never met anybody like you and me. Nobody like you and me. Picture a big brown pony with a fire in his eyes. His name, it doesn't matter, could be almost in his eyes. Charging across the meadow with you barely hanging on. Cuts into a cannon and then both of you are gone Yeah, unlike myself, they got someone else They stroll down the sidewalk in twos So lost, I'll be straight I'm gonna be late, excuse me while I have the blues Let me get this out of my system now We'll build a wall And by God he will pay I'll build a wall between your heart and mine A wall so tall, it'll stand there for all time Made of cement and rebar strong and fine to be. 
Some beef. Tofu or chicken or fish to go easy on that ham. If I've got friends, good books and good hot water, then I can be content. And except in traffic, I'm, I'm kind to everyone and deeply reverent. Please remove your shoes. When, when you, you come, come into my house, house and always wash your hands. No, I don't want I don't want you tracking in an acre or two of land. Cause I never let nobody hold me tight whose candle couldn't burn for eight days and nights. No, I never let nobody hold my hand. But that brown-eyed son of a rabbi man. Thank you! Here's a little survival tip, my... Uncle Tommy is a youngster. Might just save your life. Why? Because if a car is driving along on your side and goes out of control, goes off the road for any reason, if you're on the left, you can see him coming and get out of the way. If you were walking on the right and that happened, you'd never see him coming from behind you. Like this, for instance. So the other night, Sally comes up to me and she says, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't know. And so I said, you want to do something? And she was like, well, I guess. And I was like, Does this make you nervous? Like, well, now, why would this make you nervous? Do Down at ground level, you get a better idea of the speed we're really moving at. If you've encountered Jim's name at all before tonight, it may have been in connection with an episode that bubbled up from the bottom feeding levels of the sensational news world a few years back about a so-called young demagogue school, teaching young students the fine points of lying and reframing, also known as spin or public opinion shaping. Yo, what up, G's? It's your homeboy, Rusty Rusty Rhymes. Rutherford, there's something right now that's really, really grinding my gears. I don't know if you've heard of this young demagogue school uh, trying to teach our youth uh, techniques that'll help them 
lie and manipulate and twist their way through life. Uh, Demagoguery, for those unfamiliar with the term, is essentially propagandizing, playing on people's demons, fears, and weaknesses to influence politics and voting outside the realm of rational thought. Rational thought, of course, being difficult enough as it is. The nightmarish portrayal of this in the news was as some sort of dark, demonic dungeon where young children were being trained to lie, mislead, and take over the world. The real story was quite different, as reporter Dick Wickman explains. So Val, instead of me trying to explain this, why don't we go and talk to one of the graduates? So tell me about the attack ad episode or lesson. Well, say you wrote down uh, that you like to play soccer, and that was your best memory of the past week. Well, somebody could write an attack ad saying that you didn't like American games, like football and whatever. You preferred a European game, and you weren't a real American, and weren't right for America as a candidate. <laughs> Not right for America? That sounds a little far-fetched. Well, when you add the dark, ugly pictures of your face and the sinister music, you know, that's how all those attack ads are. It makes a scary impression. It doesn't have to make sense. People will buy it. I wrote that our family went to the zoo, and it was wonderful. And it was. So how did that become an attack ad? Well, the other person, and it really made me feel bad, she wrote about how Lucinda, that's me, Lucinda, favored the torture and imprisonment of animals, and wasn't the sort of person you would want and is wrong for America. That's how so many of these ads are written. Wrong for America. Just because we went to a zoo. She made it sound like we were out killing pets or something. At least, that's the feeling you're left with. I see. What's another project or exercise you did there? Well, we covered astroturfing. Astroturfing? I'm not sure I know what that is in terms of politics. Well, it's like grassroots. A grassroots group of citizens, only it's phony, like astroturf. I see. So, for example, say I want to do some fracking in our county here. Really mess up the water. Okay. Well, I could form a group called, like, Citizens for a Clean Environment. And we put out our ads about how we want the fracking to be done safely and cleanly. But what we really want is just to put the public at ease about fracking. Then, when we've passed the opposition and the regulations, we do what we want. I see. Very nice. Of course I don't want fracking. Or attack ads. But it's just a matter of learning what we're up against in the world of political advertising and public relations. at the start that we were given access to a huge trove of videos and recordings related to every chapter of this strange odyssey. Well, 
We also got our hands on some videos we don't think we were meant to see, and which you won't see anywhere else except here, tonight. Take a look at this video of a conference call recorded sometime in the past few years, sometime since there have been conference calls. Millions of dollars are being pledged here for the purchase of a song catalog. Guess whose? Okay, we're in 50 minutes. That recording was from a box of Buddy's business records. These players evidently call themselves the Music Investors Group. So now, let's ask another perfectly fair question. Why would anyone not already committed to the political game, especially a freewheeling artist, get involved in a presidential campaign? Watch this video, which also appears to be from Buddy's stash of obsessive record keeping and surveillance. So, your presidential run, you haven't forgotten. Did something terrible happen that made you forget? Beautiful, isn't it? It's amazing how the blue area goes with the white area. It's so white, then blue, then it's white, then it's white again. It's so deep, so deep. Now, I want you to listen carefully. You will not remember. We had this talk. Did you catch that? Let's go back. Compare face A with face B. If you saw the film, this is the face from the scene you're most likely to remember. What the connection is between this man an all-American everyman buddy is something we weren't able to pin down by airtime. You will never forget this beautiful piece. When you see it again, you will do what we ask you to do. I want you to run for president. This has all been arranged. Now you tell him to stop writing songs for other people. Hey, go away. You're gonna miss this up. That's not what we here for. I don't care, goddamn it! I'm paying you, and I want you to tell them to stop writing songs for other people. And that is no lie, how could she? And speak English, goddamn it! I'm paying you. But we wanted to get the video out there before we are legally prevented from doing so. And here's one final bit of footage, which speaks to the powerful forces which may have driven a young boy in a small New Mexico town to connect so strongly with a legendary Brill Building. Here he is visiting a few years ago. This is the Brill Building at 1619 Broadway, where many of the uh, most memorable hits of the 60s were written. We don't know whether he went inside, but we did. Consider the gym was born just five days after Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated. There was a man with a mission, right? And five days after Orville Wright died? for joining us tonight on The Danger Zone.
Met her on a Monday in the grocery store. She was so easy to talk to about cantaloupes and more. By Tuesday we were thinking about nothing but each other. By Wednesday we were old friends and by Friday we were lovers. Well, she was younger than I was, but she seemed a little wiser. A social Cinderella and a spiritual advisor. And you know a singer and a writer can use all the help he can in learning about life and what it means to be a man. She taught me how to love and give my heart away. She taught me to look forward to each new and precious day. Then she taught me how to sit and cry the whole night long. She taught me how to sing these songs all right. I've been humbled by Hubble, by those images so clear, by the photos and flybys that make it all look so near, the crisp and classy close-ups of planetary orbs. It's more surprise and splendor than this small brain can absorb. Saturn's rings, I'd like to put one on my finger. The memories of Venus are cloudy but still linger. Jupiter is hot, but that might be good for my arthritis. Mars is uninhabited, but also by creatures that could bite us. But lest you think my affection is wandering away before you get the notion that my heart is gonna stray you're still my favorite planet the planet of my birth the one I most depend on Earth it's fun to fantasize about a trip so far away Maybe I'll board a transport and fly to the moon someday. Maybe I'll get a better glimpse of Jupiter or Mars and get a little closer to those burning, shining stars. But this cloudy, crazy blue ball survives and still prevails, delicate and vulnerable but somehow tough as nails more valuable than all its silver and gold and oil's worth the lady I depend on Earth yes you're still my favorite planet the planet of my birth the one I most depend on 